But first, um, uh, the talk of the day, man. Your interview with Channel 4, uh, Kathy Newman. Mm. It start, uh, I was watching this and it was like a, uh, a self-propelled train wreck just for half an hour, it just kept on going. It was quite fun. The memes that came out of it were really good. Mm -hmm. But I think yesterday or today, it took kind of a, a more joyless turn. Mm -hmm. But first, I want to ask you, we'll talk about the aftermath after, but first, how did you experience that interview? What happened there? What, what was going on there? Well, there were lots of things going on, which is why people are watching it, right? I mean, there are lots of things going on at many levels of analysis all the time, and it's hard to determine which level of analysis you should focus on, especially when something complicated is happening. The way I experienced it was that I went into the Channel 4 studio and I sat and in, in, well, first in the green room where everything was quite friendly. Kathy was being made up in there and so we had a pleasant interchange, I would say. And uh, then I was brought into a room where the interview took place with the cameras and mm -hmm. we spoke for two or three minutes um, before the cameras rolled, and she was pleasant and engaging, um, distracted a bit, but it's exactly what you'd yeah. expect, right? Yeah. She's got her mind on many things. Yeah. But then the cameras went on, and she just was a completely different person instantly. Yeah. And so that was interesting, you know, it was interesting to me that she had both of those approaches so instantaneously at her disposal, yeah. you know. And so, of course, the first thing that entered my mind was, well, I, you know, my eyebrows went up and I thought, okay, which of these two people is the real person, yeah. right? And then she, she, well, you could say she played devil's advocate. I suppose that's one way of thinking about it. She laid out a set of ideological presuppositions, two sets actually, her set and my set. And the set of ideological presuppositions that she laid out for my side of the argument, bore very little resemblance to anything that I think or say. Yeah. And so she would ask me a question, which wasn't really a question, it was a, a barb with bait on the end of it, yeah. and I would respond, and then she would tell me... So she, you're saying? Yeah, she would, she would say what I said, except then what she would say had nothing to do with what I'd say. She was actually... Quite little to she do. Was, she was fabricating on the fly the person that she hoped the villain that I that she hoped I would be and then insisting that that was me and that denying it was a lie yeah. essentially that's what the interview was so it's deeply insincere because she was not she was playing an ideological persona and she was, wanted you to play one as well well she wanted to me to be the proper foil for that yeah. you know and and was was insistent is the right, right word that I abide by that yeah. particular decision yeah. and but there was more to to the interview than that because it was I mean I've had a lot of experience listening to people tens of thousands of hours of experience listening to people because I'm a clinical psychologist and I've had an extensive practice and I've dealt with every sort of person you could possibly imagine and a very large number of people that you couldn't imagine no matter how long you tried so I was watching her after the first minute like a clinician yeah. instead of like an interviewer and I was really paying attention to what she was doing and I truly don't believe that anything she said in that entire interview was true on its own. It was all, like, I actually have a chapter about this in my book called uh, Assume That The Person You're Listening To Knows Something You Don't mm -hmm. which is a a taxonomy of conversational types and a discussion about how to engage in a conversation if what you're trying to do is further your knowledge of the truth if both of you are trying to further yeah. your knowledge of the truth which is a proper conversation it's the highest form of conversation not the only form you could amuse each other too yeah. that's a per perfectly good form or you can have a friendly spar or you can play a primate dominance hierarchy game which is very very common um, which is mostly what was happening in that interview um, but sh she was using her words as tools to attain a particular kind of end and I couldn't exactly figure out what the end was some of it would, to, would be to dominate the interviewee especially if that's a person then that would be contaminated with ideological correctness you want to dominate your interviewee 
if you believe that they're wrong from an ideological perspective. And you want to do that, number one, to attain victory, and number two, to buttress your ideological points. Yeah. So there was that. Then there was some devil's advocate, I suppose, and, and maybe that's more forgivable because you could say that she has a responsibility to do that as a journalist, which I don't believe, by the way. Yeah. Asking difficult questions and playing the devil's advocate are not the same thing, even though sometimes playing the devil's advocate is necessary. And then I think there was an underlay of career grandstanding. I don't know that much about her, and I don't know how she's made her reputation, but she was obviously, she is obviously a combative person, and my suspicions are that she's made a success of putting people, maybe she's made a success of herself in other ways, but she's made a success of herself, at least in part, by putting people uncomfortably on the spot. Yeah. And so the, all those things were going on at the same time. And then, of course, underneath that is the fact that there was an ideological battle being played out. I would say a threefold ideological battle. There was a battle between her position, mm -hmm. which was radically neo Marxist, postmodernist, I would say. She was arguing against who she thought I was. Yeah. And so that was the battle. And then there was the position I was trying to put forward, which had virtually nothing to do with what she was discussing. She was fighting your straw man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, and it was like I was able to remain reasonably detached during the interview because I realized almost immediately that whoever she was talking to bore very little resemblance to me. Yeah. And so, I mean, she was quite sophisticated in some sense in, in what she did because she did manage to sort of her claims became so preposterous and so self-contradictory that it was difficult to remain completely detached. And I think, and this was the crux of the interview, and I think part, the part that's attracted the most attention, she had asked me at one point in a, in a provocatively self-righteous manner just what gave me the right to assume that my, uh, my privilege of free speech, let's put it that way, gave me the right to um, potentially offend someone and hurt their feelings. Yeah. And I thought about six things at the same time. But the first thing I thought was, you're a journalist. That's the last question in the world you should ever ask someone if you have any genuine integrity as a journalist. Because that's all you have as a journalist. You have the right to offend people and hurt their feelings. And so, I called her out on that, and I said, look, you know, all you've done in the last 20 minutes is everything you possibly could to make me as uncomfortable as you possibly can. Yeah. And I said it in a way that I would say was designed to let her know that I knew exactly what she was doing. And then I suggested that that was actually okay, because she had every right to do that but that she couldn't have it both ways. She couldn't make her living and her reputation using those tactics, let's say. And those are, for her, those weren't tactics of seeking the truth. They were almost purely tactics of domination, yeah. right? And one-upmanship. Yeah. And, and maybe, you know, if you live in the postmodernist world, you don't believe in truth anyways. There's just victory in power games. And so perhaps that's what she was pursuing. I don't know exactly what she was pursuing. But it was so palpably obvious to the two of us at that point that she had, in fact, done nothing except try to make me uncomfortable, yeah. that calling, on, calling, her, calling her on it left her speechless. Yeah. And then that was the only time, I would say, when I actually spoke to the genuine human being instead yeah. of the ideological yeah, that's right. so front. So the ideological front, it fell off briefly, and then you said, yeah. I got you? Yeah, well, I would say technically, and this is, might be interesting for people who are interested in Jungian psychology, if you want to understand what Carl Jung meant by animus possession, yeah, which is a very right. difficult concept, then that, that interview was a textbook case of having a discussion with someone who is animus possessed. And I can't explain what that means because it's very complicated, but, but if you go and read Jung and you read about animus possession and you need a demonstration of it so that, it, it, that you get a sense of what's, what it means, then that interview is is exactly um, indicative of that. And, and I would say, as advice to people, maybe it's more like education, anyone, see, with anyone who is animus possessed, their goal is to engage you in the argument. 
if you engage in the argument on the terms they've defined, you lose. It doesn't matter whether you win or lose. Yeah. You lose as soon as you engage in the argument. And so what I did in the interview was just not engage in the argument. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't say I did that with 100% perfection. Yeah. One of my friends, a very smart guy, there was the scene where, she, the scene, let's say, where she was taken aback. I said, ha, gotcha. And my friend said, you know, maybe you could have played that differently there. Maybe you could have said, all right, so, you know, obviously, you just thought about what I said, you know, and maybe we could actually have a real conversation about that. But, you know, she had, I had become somewhat angry, a little bit, at that point, because she had violated the rules of, that make journalism possible by suggesting that I didn't have the right to make people uncomfortable with my speech. Like, she had, go, she had broken a rule that she shouldn't have broken, in my estimation, and that made me angry. And so I said something that was designed to be witty, hopefully it was witty, and I thought that was a reasonable approach, and maybe it was. Um, but, but it might have been better to have played it straight and, and said, look, okay, now we, now we can get somewhere, you know, because we're actually talking now. Yeah, so you mean that after the ha huh, got you, you would have taken control of the conversation? We could have actually had a conversation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't have a conversation, oh. or we, well, depends on what you mean by conversation. We had a kind of conversation, but what we Exchange. actually had was a dominance hierarchy yeah. dispute. Yeah. Right. Yeah. With an ideological overlay. Yeah, definitely. So then, it went quite viral, actually. I think it Unbelievable. got Unbelievable. It was trending on YouTube. Yeah. It was number seven on trending on number YouTube. Number seven. Number seven, yeah. yeah. Crazy. And, and the, some loose clips on Facebook also got... Uh, hundreds, yeah, mil yeah. millions. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. And then, I know Derek Blackman in the U.S. made a clip, yeah, and yeah, it yeah, got yeah. 750,000 views in yeah, like one day. Yeah. Then the memes came, and then a day later, uh, it kind of took a joyless turn. Yeah, yesterday and today, yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's amazing. Just well, you see, man. so here's the strange thing, eh? So I kind of played, let's say, knight on white horse. And so the Guardian yesterday published a astoundingly reprehensible article. About your book? No, about the Channel 4 interview. Um, no, they, they've done some nice interviews about my book. Um, so they've been kind of all over the place yeah, with me, yeah. you know. But the Channel 4 people claim that Kathy has been targeted with threats, you know. Um, a torrent of online abuse by internet trolls. Yeah. It's like 50,000 trolls, you know, that's a lot of trolls. You might start thinking maybe they're not all trolls, but in any case, overwhelmed by misogynistic abuse and threats and that they had called in a security specialist yeah. to assess the level of threat. And so it was the beginning of the attempt to twist the story around so that the story became um, Kathy Newman, poor, embattled, Channel 4 newscaster was merely trying to do her job, even though she might have been a bit provocative, interviewed alt-right hero Dr. Jordan Peterson um, in an honest manner to, to expose his agenda, posted the results to YouTube and was immediately mobbed by his army of internet trolls, right? So she went from, so my sense is she went from um, journalist playing a variety of complicated games to, 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 to target of criticism online, to heroin, embattled heroin in the panoply of martyrs to whom similar things have happened in the past. And what's terrible about it, so, so and I inadvertently, I would say, contributed to that because when the Guardian story came out, I read it, and the story purported to be about the threats that she had received. But really the story, because the story opened with the description of me, and the description was, let's call it, far from flattering. Yeah. You know, it was the same old thing. Dr. Peterson, he's a provocateur, he has an army of trolls. If anybody ever um, dares to challenge him, let's say, you know, all they're doing is honestly challenging, the trolls come out, and then they have to fear for their lives. And that, yeah. was, that was the story. That's the narrative the, now. The, threat, the threats were just the prerequisite for the story. And then, yeah, like a dozen UK 
news media sources, the, the, the newspapers in particular, have picked this, this up. Some even more critical of me than that, some in a slightly more balanced fashion. But, um, and see, when the Guardian story broke, I tweeted something. I said, look, if you're, I've looked at the tweet, tweet or the YouTube comments, and most of them were merely criticism. But if you're threatening her, well, stop, yeah. you know, because we had an exchange of words, yeah. which is what we're supposed to do. I think this message to your followers was one of the most liked tweets you ever put out. Yeah, but here's the terrible thing about it. You know, what happened was that the fact that I tweeted that was instantly used as validation for the claim that there were threats. Yeah, yeah. And that was just, yeah, that's what happened. And mm -hmm. see, it's weird because when I wrote that, I thought, there's part of me that thought, that thought that that might happen. There was a little warning bell that went off that said, look, you know, there's no evidence that these threats are credible. And if you respond by by asking people to back off, you're also implying that there are people who, who should back off, that this yeah. is real. And I thought, no, I'm going to do it anyways, because she has been targeted. She has been subject to a very large number of very vitriolic comments. And maybe that's enough. And yeah. so, you know, it's okay to come out and say that's enough. Yeah. But the thing is, it wasn't okay, because as soon as I did it, then the fact that I did it was used as proof that all of these claims were valid. And that, that just floored me. Like, I was very distraught, I think is the right word about that this morning, because yeah, I, didn't, I didn't see that coming. But so, were there threats against her? Have you seen them? Define threat. Threats of violence? There's no threats that were sufficient to get the police involved. Mm. So what, what they see, the Guardian was very vague about what the threats were and how and who these security people were. They were vague about that. But the implication was that the threats were serious enough so that security people needed to be called in to advise. Yeah. Okay, well, the narrative has clarified a little bit in the last day. Now they just said, well, they had security consultants come in to look at the threats. Yeah. Well, so then you think, well, is that because they're actually concerned about the threats? Or is that because they want to spin off a story about how the threats are so severe that they had to call in security consultants? Yeah. And like, I have a strong... So let's say it's 10% the former and 90% the latter, which is what I would estimate. And so, but it doesn't matter now because the narrative has already been twisted around. Yeah. Now, I don't know what, I don't know if that's going to, uh, I have no idea if that's going to actually backfire on Channel 4 or if it will have the effect of further damaging my reputation. I mean, I know the Canadian media has picked up the victimized Kathy Newman yeah. narrative and run with it yeah. as well. Well, as well the they're, cer media. they're certainly trying. The Independent, I think, was a piece today, has a subtitle, when white men feel they're, when white men feel they're losing power, any level of nastiness is possible. Yeah. In the struggle to, to regain this. Yeah, I know. Uh, that was, that was definitely one of the most appalling headlines yeah. that I've ever seen a credible news organization produce. And they, like, see, one of the things I pointed out in my book, in, in 12 Rules for Life, is that as a clinician, talking to many hundreds of people for many thousands of hours and watching how things unfold in their life from the earliest stages of their childhood memories to their current state of life and, and into the future. One thing I have learned is that no one ever gets away with anything. And so this reporter has made a kind of statement, a kind of provocative statement, and yeah. he or she doesn't understand that there will be consequences of that. And, and perhaps not the sort of consequences that the author will tie back to that statement, but that's the sort of, that's a, that's a statement that you only make if you are very historically ignorant, or very uncautious, incautious, or if there's a very dark part of you hoping things will go very wrong very soon. And I would say that there's a reasonable possibility that things are going to go very wrong very soon. For whom? For all of us. For all of us. None of what's happening in this polarized atmosphere is amusing to me. What happened, <clears throat> see, even with the Channel 4 interview, you know, and maybe I was a bit self-congratulatory, let's say, when I made my 
sort of satirical gotcha statement. I'm not, and, and then I would say you could read what happened with Channel 4 as a victory for me and as a loss for Kathy. Now, depends on what she was aiming at. If she was aiming at 3 million views on YouTube in two days, then it's not a loss. You know, and for me, it's like, well, it, my book went up to number two in, on Amazon.com in the US the next day, right? It's number one in Canada, it's number three in the UK, all on Amazon. I couldn't have asked for more publicity, yeah. right? Yeah. And so I could also be sitting back and saying, well, you know, she tried to, she, my, a person who regarded herself as my ideological opponent tried to go after my philosophy and my reputation on national TV, failed brutally and has been taken apart for it. It's like, this is a good day, but I don't regard it as a good day. I don't think it's a good day. As what do you regard it? I think that it's evidence of the instability of the times that we're in. It would have been much better for me and for everyone else if what we would have had was a real conversation. So, so it's not good. Yeah. It's not good. And I asked Kathy in a variety of different ways now if she would sit down and have an actual conversation because the right way for this to end is not for me to declare victory because I don't regard it as a victory. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that I would have liked to have the tables turned. I'm not saying that I would have been happy with a loss, yeah. but what happened in there was not an optimized victory. Um, what we need to do, what would be best, is if she would sit down with me for about an hour. On camera as well? On camera, where we could actually have a discussion. Like I would like to ask her something, for example. I've been trying to puzzle this out. I, I saw a picture of her today. That, that was a tweet, it was a tweet by one of her friends and, and they said that the, the tweet was something like we're amusing ourselves watching the Twitter comments while waiting for the police in investigation, okay? And then there's a picture of Kathy yeah. holding a tablet, you know, looking shocked in a very pleased way, I think is the right yeah. way of, and you see that's kind of what I'm worried about is that she is shocked in a rather pleased way. Was this the police investigation into her, the threats to her? Pre presumably, it wasn't clear, but uh, presumably. Yeah. But I think she removed those tweets. She now. did yeah. remove them, but it's hard to remove things from uh, Twitter. Yeah. yeah, and so, but I've also been sitting here thinking, like, you know, people write me and they say, well, you must be, I'm writing you a letter of support, you must be receiving an overwhelming amount of hate mail, um, you know, keep up the good work. I don't receive any ha hate mail. I received like five pieces of hate mail in, in the last 15 months. I, I can't believe that that's Very the modest. case. Hmm? Very modest number. It's, it's, yeah, and, and they weren't particularly vitriolic. Yeah, they were criticisms, you know. Yeah. So I don't get hate mail. Now, I don't know why, but I don't. Um, but, you know, if, if the tables were turned, you know, and if I had done an interview and then 50,000 people had written critical comments about me in two days, ranging from like pretty severely critical to pretty damn vitriolic. Yeah. I would be having a rough time of it, man. I'd be sitting there thinking, Jesus, you know, what the hell did I do? What did I do that was so deeply wrong that this was the result? But I don't know what Kathy's thinking. That does not seem to constitute her response so far. Well, I, you know, I hesitate to guess at it, but but there's no evidence that that's her response. Yeah. You know, she said, oh, well, it was all in good fun. It was part of the game. Um, thank you for being a good sport. Um, if it's not a game for me. Viva feminism. Yeah, exactly. Viva feminism. Well, really. And, and I mean, what my impression of the response to her interview is that virtually everyone watching it online, and I'm, I'm judging this response by the number of likes to dislikes and the comments which are running about 80 to 1 yeah. against her which is like 50 to 1 against you is not good yeah. like 80 to 1 against you is really really not good yeah. there's something wrong and so and these aren't trolls these aren't my army of trolls these these three million people who've watched the video or it's more than that actually that's that's all sorts of people everywhere yeah. and they're they're not happy with the way the interview went. And 
that would crush me. Yeah. You know, and I think that's the right response to that. It's like when you're, when you re receive overwhelming public criticism like that, the right response should be not glee at stirring up the hornet's nest, but careful reanalysis of what you did. That's hard. It's not as hard as the alternative, because if you're riding high and there's a correction coming and you keep forestalling it, the correction will get larger and larger and larger and larger and finally when it comes you will not be able to tolerate it. And that's the situation I believe that she's in. The correction is coming. Has she responded to your request to sit down again? No, but it's been made very, very, you know, recently. Okay. okay. So I've had a colleague of hers contacted me and said that he would do what he could to put us in, in touch and other people have you know been working behind the scenes and yeah. I suggested it on Twitter and you know I'm likely going to contact my press agents at Penguin and see if they want to contact her and ask but because that's the right outcome the right outcome yeah. is we have a we had this bit of combat let's say it produced a scandal now we actually talk about it. Yeah. No tricks, yeah. just a conversation. And then everybody wins, right? Because I can admit whatever mistakes I made, she can admit whatever mistakes she made, we can drop the persona, yeah. which is what she had. Yeah, it was an animus possessed persona, technically speaking. She could drop that, we could actually have a discussion. Yeah. Like, I would open the discussion by asking her why she was taken aback when I asked her about her treatment of me in the interview. Yeah. You know, and people have also been spinning that as my claims to have been victimized in the interview. You know, so, which is another sign of how pathological the discourse has become. Yeah. Yeah. Because pointing out what's happening and claiming some kind of victim status are by no means the same thing. Yeah. So what you're saying that although it might look as a, as a, as a victory for you in the in the attention it has it's not generated. a healthy victory. It's not a healthy victory. Right. And, and taking back to that, you said that it's actually a sign of the times where things could go really wrong for all of us really soon. Yeah, we're, we're playing with fire. Yeah, what do you mean by this? Can you, can you elaborate? Well, things go wrong in cultures all the time, right? You get, you get the polarization increases until people start to act it out. You know, I mean, I'll give you an example. You know, I always pay attention to what happens at the back of my mind, to the bottom of my mind, let's say. And um, when I learned from Carl Jung, for example, one thing was that if you l watch what happens in your imagination while you're speaking, while things are happening to you, you'll see little dreamlike fragments happening all the time. Mm -hmm. They're not in words, they're really more like, they're more like brief dreams. Jung thought we were dreaming all the time, even when we were awake. And, you know, today, I was reviewing maybe 10 or 11 of these newspaper articles that had played this twisty game and accused me of like sicking my internet trolls on the poor hapless journalist and I thought this was the dark part of me right that's the shadow part thought if I wanted to sick my internet trolls on channel 4 then there'd be nothing but broken windows and riots and then there's a little part of me that thinks wouldn't that be fun Right, and that's where we're at. It's like, because I'm a reasonable person, a very reasonable person, but even though I can... you these thoughts in the back of your mind? Oh, yes. Yeah. And I pay attention to them because I know that they're, they're part of the collective unconscious, right? Yeah. They're the shadow part. And yeah, yeah. when there's part of me thinking, well, wouldn't that just be perfectly goddamn delightful? Then there's lots of people who are not only thinking that way sometimes, but thinking that way all the time. And they're just waiting for that to be the proper response. Well, you see this with the Antifa yeah. violence in the United States and with the Charlottesville thing as well. So, but basically what you're saying is that when you have these dark thoughts in your mind, in the back of your mind, you, you kind of tap into the collective unconscious of, of mm. the culture you're embedded in. Definitely, definitely. There's, well, there's no doubt about it, is that like the dark part of me and the dark part of you is the same thing in some ways, yeah. you know, and we live in the same culture. And so yeah. it's going to manifest itself in a similar manner. Yeah. So you're saying the polarization that we're seeing right now, that we are speaking out, mm -hmm. it's not 
in the future we will act out that polarization. Well, if we don't, if we keep accelerating it, yeah. especially if we keep accelerating it with lies, yeah. you know, and, and this, this whole um, Channel 4 rat's nest is like 90% lies, yeah. maybe more. And, you know, a lot of it's ideologically motivated lies, but it doesn't matter. It yeah. still lies. Like Kathy, as I said, there was virtually nothing she said in that interview that was actually coming from her, like, like a deep part of her, the soul of her. All persona. It was all persona. It was all persona. And, and, and all use of words in an in a expedient manner, as tools yeah. to obtain, I think, probably probably status, dominant status, and reputation. Yeah.